sure that I can get three minutes. My name is Carl Hingis, and I want to just welcome you. Um, I was blessed to be grafted into the Reinhardt family about 30 some years ago. And uh, Ralph just welcomed me with open arms. What a wonderful father in law he was. I married the firstborn, Ruthie. Um, firstborn daughter. I just love her. Mom and her dad. We thank you for being here. Thank you for showing your support. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you for the food and the, the love that you've shown, the card, and the, the little encouraging notes on Facebook and all the all the other media. We just thank you. We thank you so much. About 10 years ago, mom planned a retirement party for dad. Dad refused to retire. <laughs> He said, I will retire when God retires. You guys thought you were coming to a funeral. You're coming to a retirement party. <laughs> no, this is obviously a funeral. Hearts are broken. But this is a time of celebration of the life of Ralph Lee Reinhardt. And we mourn. We mourn. It, it is the most, one of the most difficult things I've ever had to go through, I have to say. Devastating, really. The loss. And we, we're very sad, but we we cry as those who have hope. We have hope. It, it looks like death won, but death did not win. He is not here. This is just his body. He is in heaven. And this is a funeral, obviously, but it's also a home going. It's a time of rejoicing. Time of rejoicing. What? God can do with the life of one man that's just given himself over to Christ. Um, we're here to honor dad, honor husband, co-worker, grandfather, brother, for honoring him for life well done. Well did. But we all know, we all know that Christ is the one that made the difference in Dad's life. Amen. And Dad would be the first one to point to Christ. Because he knows Christ is the correct his life. The work of God in his life. Today I want you to just notice a couple of things. Just one, his love for his family. His love for his family. Just point that out. We, you're, you're going to hear from the daughter, you're going to hear from the siblings and the grandchildren. Dad loved his family, sacrificed for his family. But you know what? I want you to notice that Christ, or God's, or Dad's love for, for Christ. Christ is the center of Dad's life. That's why family was so important to him. So we mourn and we weep as a family. But we know. This is a time of celebration as well. I want to leave you with one verse here. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And we, we're going to be comforted today. We're going to be comforted. Um, you know, let God comfort us through his word. We're going to hear from the word. We're going to hear the testimony of, again, what God can do to a life that is just surrendered over to Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for Dad. I thank you for his life, a life well lived. He wasn't a flamboyant man, he wasn't flashy, but he was faithful. And Lord, we thank you for being a God of all comfort. We depend on that comfort. We need that comfort. And Lord, we just call upon that grace and that mercy now at this time. We thank you. We thank you. Christ, thank you for his redemptive plan. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's working in that life, bringing him to the point that he, he is now. Again. Securing him, sealing him until he reached glory. Now he is in glory. Thank you for a life well lived. You know it's because of Christ. And we thank you, we just pray that you would be honored, you would be glorified.
Bible today. They're crucified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering knowing that our suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given that to us. Romans 5, 25. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth complaining, comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to utility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that has been seen is not hope, for who hopes in what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for with patience. A few verses that help us with comfort. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you, Psalm 33, 20. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. Psalm 119, 81. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And 
in his word, I hope. Psalm 130, verse 5. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Psalm 147, 11. I will end with this verse, these verses here. Probably very familiar, but we always seem to cut it off at verse 23. We don't go to verse 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. All of our hope is in Christ. That was Ralph's hope. And my prayer is that is the hope of all who are in this room. Amen. Thank you. Conversations uh, and one time tithing 
came up. And she said Ralph shared that uh, he and Carolyn tied. And she said, well, if Ralph does it, it must be the right thing to do. So she began to start tithing. She said Ralph gave her her first rap Christmas present. And she spoke about that. Uh, Lula said that uh, Dad was gone. He had passed away. And so Ralph was a big brother. And he got pulled over on big brother duty. And uh, she said, I want it my way. And Mom was trying to tell me no. And so she got Ralph to go and give the big brother a call. You know Dad. He went in and just cried the whole time talking to her. <laughs> And she cried. She said, I, she said, I don't know what it was, but I didn't want to do it again. <laughs> Marie talked about just how, uh, one of the funny things they laughed about, apparently they had a reunion and she got left out and it was dad's, dad's fault. <laughs> That's a running joke still today. Um, Nancy was a baby, uh, one of the big girls, and she would write letters to dad. And the only letter she knew was the letter E. So she asked Dad, did you read my last letter? And uh, he said, I had a little hard time understanding it. But uh, <laughs> these siblings are so tight. Uncle John Jake's going to be coming up and talking more about them. But we do sibling chat still today. Saturday at 4 o'clock, that's what they do. You won't get a hold of them on the phone. And I just, the cousins, we were laughing. I would love to sing them on their first Zoom chat. <laughs> work the remote controls and <laughs> what that was like, but anyway, actually, they, they would give you more credit. <laughs> so that uh, went to Ben Newman Elementary, 1958, Mullins High School graduate, lots of class reunions still up to this point. Now, 1963, uh, Virginia Polytech Institute, that's now known as what? Virginia Tech. So electrical engineering, mom right there by the side, graduated from General Nursing School, Charleston General Nur School of Nursing in 1964. And so as you know, if you know Dad, his first love is Jesus, and his second love is Mom. And it is a crazy love. Um, they started dating, Mom was 20, and Dad was 23. They met at an Arthur Murray Dance Studio by Christian Businessmen Association Committee, and it was a banquet they had back then. And, uh, so they were introduced to some, to some people, dad's boss, mom's parents, and mom's thought when she saw that was, am I going to marry that man? <laughs> so they went out on a date, uh, really neat. They went out on the first date, uh, Camden Amusement Park. Anyone remember that? <laughs> okay, amen. So that was the first date. That second date with her, asked her out, he stood her up. <laughs> I can't believe that there was a third day. <laughs> you really good, Mom. <laughs> so Mom said, uh, so Dad said Mom was a hard cookie to, a hard nut to crack. And she said, I don't know why he said that. You're going to find out. Uh, Mom said there wasn't chemistry between us. She said, but I never refused the date from Dad. Our third day was at Manager Golf, and we began to hold hands. We began to hold hands. So here's the hard nut to crack. They're at the country, that's the Balanchy homestead. And Dad turned to Mom and said, I love you. And uh, that was the first time he ever shared that with, with Mom. And she just smiled. <laughs> <laughs> but faint heart never went for a lady. So Dad persisted. And they kept dating for 18 months. Uh, so he went to Chicago. And while they were there, after 18 months of day, Dad said, I want to marry you. Will you marry me? And Mom said, I'll pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you are a hard enough to <laughs> So that was in October, by Christmas. They, their love had been affirmed, so dad got her a ring. That came at Christmas time. Mom said the only thing I could find wrong with him was that he walked on the wrong side of the sidewalk. <laughs> so she said, I'm married. So they fell in love uh, at a uh, John Stott a, uh, in a Billy Graham conference. And it's just been amazing. June 25th, 1966, 54, almost 55 years ago, they were married. 
Bible Center Church in Charleston with the Reverend Charles Hendricks. They honeymooned at Blackwater Falls. Um, early marriage memories, dad was working for, I think maybe you guys remember, Simmons Solding Mining Company. Uh, he would come home black every night because he worked down in the coals, coal mines. Uh, they lived in a house, and it was an old coal mine house, and uh, $20 a month. So they somehow came up with it, lived in a place called Boomer. Um, and so I guess that's a town here in West Virginia. Mom was a nurse. Uh, they decided they couldn't stay there any longer. And so they moved into a hotel for three months. I don't know if it was bigger. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> moved into a hotel, the Pocahontas Hotel in Welch. And so after three months of that, they said, we need to get a place. So he moved to Bradley, West Virginia. And along came Ruthie, was born in 1967, in October. Nita came in 69 uh, of, of January. And Sandy came in 72 of June. And so you can catch that hotel train I guess. I don't know. We're going to be going. And a lot of babies came quick. And so they were piled up in diapers. Uh, and mom said she was really busy, quit her nursing job. But three little girls in great affection in the house. Ruth became known as Ruthie. She was known as my little girl. And then when Nita came, uh, she got, her name got changed to my big girl. Last night I asked her if I could call her big old girl. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take. Uh, <laughs> so Nita, Nita came. Uh, Juanita came, that's her name, Juanita, and uh, <laughs> she was called Neat. And then the long, long, wild Nita Lynn, that was her nickname. And I said, man, how did you come up with that name? And he said, it was one of my favorite girlfriends. <laughs> 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 and then Until we went away on the weekend, Sandy said, 
uh, she said, hey, my parents want you to go with us on the weekend. I thought, wow, that's cool. So we had a great time, and we had a fun day, and then uh, we checked the hotel, and we brought all our bags in, and it was late at night, and everyone got ready for bed, and then it hit me. And we were, I was looking at the room, and I said, I didn't want to say anything. Mom jumped in bed, in one bed, and sat in the middle right next to the center aisle, same time from the other side against the wall. Dad got in bed in the center aisle, they held hands. And I just stood there. I was looking for what hole I was going to curl up in one morning. And Mom said, well, get bed with Ralph, girl. It's time to turn the light off. <laughs> and I made eye contact with Sandy, and she just covered her face. <laughs> and I just, I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I got back with Dad. Dad was there, and I was all the way on the edge. And I was laying there in bed, and I said, I have got to be the first man ever to sleep with my father-in-law before I sleep with my wife. <laughs> and I Back 
Do not, do not make a decision past 10 o'clock because nothing good happens past 10. <laughs> Girls, when you get married, we saw your end of the table off. <laughs> I'm out here just working for the filthy lucre. <laughs> Always keep a $100 bill in your pocket. I like driving new cars. If you got to dance, you got to pay the bill. God has you there for a season. Always be faithful and use your spiritual gifts in God's glory. Girls, <laughs> marry the first time for love, and then second time, marry for the filthy lucre. <laughs> Pray every night with your wife. You say every three months, uh, three months into dating, you ask, so kids, when are you getting married? You'd say, um, oh my goodness. How many of y'all ever spent, spent a night at dad's house in the wintertime? Is the house cool? <laughs> We don't know how cold it is because the thermostat stops at 50. <laughs> it is a cold house. One of the hamsters went into hibernation once because it was so cold. <laughs> they were having a funeral. They had a because the sun patch was there. <laughs> they thought it was dead. It was that cold. But it's warm with love. When Dad would pray, he always would say, Heavenly yeah, Father, we just thank you. And he'd go into his prayer. He wears d neck t-shirts, greasy cups, honey, boiled eggs on Sunday morning, black coffee, and meat and cheese. Virginia Tech, new cars, uh, Fox News, Sudoku, paper, and dad in his recliner, Jeeps, going in the country, hiking trails, giving grandkids a penny for every log they carried in, and then he raised it to a nickel. He's an early riser, never eat chicken again. People, uh, he always would tell us, finish well. Many trips to Cobra Ranch. Um, he was the perfect girl dad. He would pray with mom every single night. They prayed all together all the time. He brought many meals and visited people on a regular basis. That was dad. He would use his pocket knife to cut his fingernails. He never knew they were fingernail clippers. <laughs> He would then give you a slice of his apple with that same knife. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa, his mud puddle, the moment he pulled up, he was filling up the mud hole with water for the grandkids. His plaid shirts, plain scrambler, Brian Harper unions. That was dad. We mentioned he got saved when he was 16. Dad's life was completely transformed. He was baptized. And then he, as a transformed man, began to transform lives. And as many of you, Dad believed in the bride of Christ. Jesus was all in with the bride of Christ, the church, and he died for the church. And Dad was all in with church. And he loved the bride of Christ, the way Christ loved his bride. He was a Sunday school teacher, a woman leader, deacon, elder, song leader. Every work day, every men's prayer breakfast, he even played on the men's basketball team for the church. He was at his church every for their 52 plus years. That was that. He had a well worn out Bible filled out with well worn out prayer cards. He had a prayer life that was amazing. He read through his Bible 60 times in his lifetime. He read through it once a year from the time he was 20. Dad was a man of evangelism and the gospel and of great wisdom of the word of God. <laughs> he and mom had a life of hospitality. He did discipleship God's way, marriage God's way, family God's way, living God's way. They gave and gave and gave of their lives and their finances. Dad understood that not I, but Christ living. I'll close with this. That dad was the one that showed me how to love God. Showed me. He showed me how to love my wife. He showed me how to love my kids. And taught me how to love with God's love. Did it for me.
My name is Chris Watkins. I married Anita 30 years ago and got drafted into the well. I was really struggling with what to share from all of the things and all the experiences that we've had with our altitude. We were in the car this morning, and I said, Brandon, I want to share. And I just, Mom was reading through some Psalms for us today, and it's exactly the words that have come to my heart. Many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful hand keeps mine. The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are the children I have. God promises in Exodus that bless. The children are the faithful, those who love him, the thousand generations. And my family is a beneficiary of that heritage because of Brown. We just love Dad so much. One of his, one of his favorite songs was Amazing Grace. We're going to sing that together. The words will be on the screen, or you can use your hymnal, it's on page 202. So let's stand together and see.
also attended extra things like the men's prayer breakfast, the church work days. He and mom always taught us to love Christ Church, and they taught us the joy of serving, even on an early Saturday morning at church work day. At the time, I didn't appreciate I do now, but he just found such joy in just being with God's people, no matter what you were doing. He loved being with God's people, and um, he was just wanting to encourage others to walk with the Lord. Another common thing here in our fear is how much he loved God's word. And um, as has already been mentioned, he was on his 61st time of reading through the entire Bible. He was saturated with God's word. Everybody talks about how wise he was, but that's why he was so wise, because he knew the word of God, and he lived by it. We often went to special services, Bible conferences, um, we even went to Bible conferences for family vacations sometimes. And even though I didn't appreciate it a whole lot when I was younger, <laughs> I do now. Because I had parents that wanted me to know the Lord and to grow with Him. And those things are what get you through days like this. So I'm so thankful to Him. I feel like He prepared us for His homegoing, our whole life. So much of who I am is because of the influence of my dad. My love for NFL football. <laughs> we rooted for the Cowboys every Sunday afternoon. That was the Tom Landry days, by the way. I'm a stupid fan now. Um, <laughs> his love for the outdoors is now mine because of all those nature hikes and walks through the woods that I went on with him. I would like to think that my smile and my laugh and my positive outlook on life are similar to his because he is such a happy person. Always a smile on his face. There's so much I can say about my dad. He's touched a lot of lives in his eight years, and all of these of you are such a testament to that. So I'm thankful for his example of faithfulness and integrity in every area of his life. He always told us that he wanted to finish well, and finish well he did. He was a quiet man whose life spoke very loudly of Christ. I thank the Lord for the blessing of getting to be his daughter. One of the songs that his siblings would sing goes like this. There will be no sorrows there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness and no pain, no more parting. But forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. And on May 15th, that glorious spring day, that weather that the sun was shining just like today, blue sky, the Lord took Daddy by the hand. What a day, what a glorious day. Serve the Lord. 
And this was really fleshed out by a life of loving and serving others. My dad was the most selfless person I've ever known. My earliest memories are riding on my daddy's big shoulders, high above the world, eating my first jelly donut when he let me ride to work with him early one morning. I was the only girl in the room. I think we were at a coffee shop, not like Starbucks. <laughs> they had jelly donuts I had never had one before. I remember him leading songs at church, rocking back and forth to the beat with his big smile. He took us to watch the New River Gordon Bridge be built every Friday evening. I feel like it was Friday evenings after work. And he loved to hike in the woods and go to all the state parks. We talked about that. But, um, when I was in elementary school, I just especially remember that my dad worked faithfully in our church as a WANA program. And that's for youth. It's a Bible memory program. And we would pack our Jeep. Okay, it was, we, it was not safe. <laughs> but I think we counted 13 kids. But we went and picked up um, boys from the projects in Mount Hope, our school. And um, my dad, so I think we had 13 of us in the car one time. My dad started letting one of those boys each week come and spend the night at our house and sleep in the master bedroom that my mom and dad sacrificially designated as their guest room. I think that's the a lot about how my parents felt about others. And you can tell by the reaction of these little guys that they were staying in the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> In fact, mom can tell you the story of a little guy that he didn't know what to do with covers. Like, he said, I froze all night, and the bed was just perfectly made up. He didn't know how to get in a bed with covers. These brown and young boys would eat breakfast with our family, and my dad would drive them to school Thursday morning. I'm guessing many of them had no dad at home. My dad was the dad to many fatherless. I can't even count the number of young men and young couples that my dad and mom have mentored and counseled and taken to dinner and cooked for, but they just always have opened up their lives to serve others first. And I, in this line that we've been in for a few days, I've talked to a lot of you that were mentored by my dad. And it's just a fresh you guys are, he loved you guys. As I grew into a rebellious teenager, way too cool for parents, I can remember my dad taking me on a date to the Crossroads Mall to buy me an orange Julius, which for us was a pretty big treat. And knowing how much my dad hated the shop, that was really a sacrifice. <laughs> but dad was trying hard to break into my teenage world somehow. And even though I resisted his efforts, I'm sure I didn't give him credit that day, he didn't give up on me. He was so intentional. He wanted me to dress modestly and to date the right kind of guys. And he was always gentle with me because he loved me and he really wanted the best for me. One day, as a, I feel like I was about a senior, I, I learned that one of my girlfriends had made some bad choices that resulted in some unfortunate consequences for her life. And in my piety, I told my dad that I would just stop hanging out with her and she was going to be that kind of girl. And my dad, in his gracious wisdom, corrected me and he said, Nina, don't you think that she needs you more now than ever before? Dad was such a man who could balance truth with grace. Dad was really like Christ. He never set out to impress, and yet he made such an impression on so many. He loved people. He was gracious and warm to everyone, regardless of rank or station. He hung out with senators and janitors, and he treated them absolutely the same. His heart was so loving and open. He would say, everybody puts on their pants one leg at a time. <laughs> and he just was never driven by stuff or status. His goal was always to bring glory to God, to serve him, and to love and serve others, truly the only things that matter in his life. My dad really took seriously his job to instruct our family in the ways of the Lord. And although my dad wasn't really a dynamic public speaker, and he often struggled to get his words he was faithful to follow God's command to bring us up in the admonition of the Lord. When our family gathers, my dad insists that we have devotions as a family, and we share scripture together, and what God's doing in our lives, and we pray together. What a treasure that is. Our family, that's the highlight, really, of our family devotions, is that time. 
I do think our grandchildren are at the place in their life now that that's not the boring talk that, that we see. We see it's not even how relevant that is. Although the world may look at dad's stock portfolios and investments and assets to determine the success of his life today, I am here to testify that because my dad invested in what matters in this life, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love others as you love, as you would love yourself, because dad did this, I have received an inheritance that is invaluable. It will never run out, it will never spend out. In fact, as evidence on these front rows, the dividends have multiplied. There will be no replacing this great man. I honestly cannot imagine my life without him. And I will miss his big smile, his warm hugs, his laugh, his love, his daily prayers for me. But because of Jesus, I know I will see him someday. Ralph Reinhardt lived his life in a way that left us no doubt that he is in heaven today. May God alone receive glory. Thank you for being here. I mean, it means the world to my family and you guys. You guys can. Um, as I was thinking about how to talk about my grandpa, uh, you know, I have a journalism minor, and I'm thinking, you know, what's the most important thing first, right? I mean, what, what, what is the most important thing about my grandpa? And you know what? It's, it's that he loved Jesus. Um, his life. Louder than a thousand sermons. He truly talked the talk of what it meant to be, what it meant to be a Christian, and he actually walked that way. Um, and so few people do. Um, every morning you can find Grandpa with his Bible, <laughs> a worn old age Bible <laughs> that he's reading through. Um, and at, at night he's praying with his wife. Um, and that's one thing that he told us is that um, always pray with your wife. Uh, that, that's, that's the biggest key. And, and so far my wife and I have been able to do that. That's because of him. He was present. Um, he spent his time visiting others, I mean, investing in our lives. I mean, he never missed a wedding, never missed a reunion, um, he never missed a graduation. He was planning on coming to my brother's on Friday. Um, he made family a priority. Um, no matter the cost to him, he loved his young chick <laughs> and the uh, He loved his daughters, Ruth, Anita, and Sandy. And he loves grandkids. I won't bother you with naming all these folks up here, but uh, <laughs> but he loved them to death. Um, and uh, he loved us, you know, every summer. We, this whole group of folks spent a lot of time together. Um, we we get together every summer for a week, and we still we're planning on doing so uh, this summer, but um, and also every Christmas. And so we love being together. Um, and, and and his his emphasis on family is really what um, keeps us up here, keeps us together. And, and I think we've all um, learned to value that. Um, he was faithful. Um, he finished the race, as the Apostle Paul writes about in the book of Timothy. Um, he invested in other people and not just family. I think this room is, is a testament to that. Um, I also made Grandpa, not to brag or anything, but I made him a Grandpa. <laughs> and I also made him a great Grandpa. Um, my children uh, can't watch right now, but if they were here, I'm sure they would watch if you could tell us two things, I think it would boil down to, to these two things. Follow Jesus above all. I think that would be his, his first thing. And show God's love to the people around, around you uh, unconditionally. And never take that the opportunity to talk to him and uh, invest in him for granted. And I hope to honor him by doing those two things. I hope you will too. Just as I also am with Christ. This verse reminds me of Grandpa. 
because he was always the most of Christ. He was an incredible example of humility, generosity, love, and patience. His life always pointed you away from himself and towards Christ instead. He was always helping others, and he put himself in the mind of everyone else. God was the first and foremost in his life. He read his Bible first to begin the day, and he prayed long prayers with Pamela before bed to end the night. He did this each and every single day, no matter what else would happen in that day or how busy his life was. This life is one that we can look at and model our own after. We can truly follow him as he followed Christ. And just like Paul wrote again in 2 Timothy 4, 7, Grandpa can truly say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. I'm so thankful for being able to learn and grow under Grandpa's wonderful example. Our family in this moment, I am confident of every member of my family. 
my salvation. We will all live forever and ever in heaven and never see you for eternity. And we'd stand the test of time, praising our great creator. <laughs> because we are all saved in Christ Jesus. <sighs> a few add ons, pretty confident in their salvation, and look forward to one day being able to. Thank you for the many years we had together. I was blessed with two grandfathers, but only one grandma. It angers me that my job brought me a last moment to work for Christmas's birthdays. Family reunions and pilgrimage. However, I always cherish the times we have alone. Building fires, tractor rides, walks in the woods, or riding logs in your truck for work, which always included the stop of Barry Corey. <laughs> Thank you for always supporting my crazy life decisions. I still don't have a degree, but I'm be working on it. Especially now that it's free. <laughs> <laughs> I work with some of the most talented, proficient, proficient soldiers in the world. We hunt down and kill them because of this country wherever they hide. There I they are. My own definition is warriors. My grandpa was the spiritual warrior I have ever known. He trained every morning over the his Bible. He kept in constant communication, prayer, with his grandmother. My grandpa never gave an inch. He constantly furthered the gospel wherever he went, wherever, or whoever he had my grandpa was never out missing these stacking bodies, but my grandpa stacked souls. I hope one day to have a fraction of his soul count. He fought the good fight and he finished the race, y'all. I love you, grandpa. Can't wait to see you in heaven.
I just have to say, you know, you may think, well, Ralph just pursued family. He didn't just pursue family. He wasn't just trying to have a good picture. He pursued God. And that makes all the difference. He pursued God as a man of Christ. Now, Uncle John, I don't know how you can follow that up, but uh, this is Ralph's oldest brother. I'm going to give the mic to him. Brand new shirt for Truth Club, but he didn't even have to do it at all. And he never saw 
such a rough time as moving comes asleep, or full, or sound and calm, when that which grew from out the boundless deep turns toward home, twilight and evening fell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness or farewell when I embark, for though from our 
from old, from old they're born of town and place. The flood may bear me far. I hope to see my Savior face to face when I have crossed the bar. Now, that, was, that was just one of my memories of our past. Read you, I'll, I'll read a few verses here from the Advocate to share the scripture also. And this is one that's real familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. When I'm sorry that the lights might get out of my eyes or my head. For though I walk through the valley, this is the one I want to make sure you remember on this part of it. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil that are with me. There are a lot of people talking about that and being dead. But we got to remember, it didn't say he's walking through death. He's walking through the shadow of death. It's just a shadow. We, it has no power over us. We can go out here and stand beside the road and, uh, and, 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 and have a huge truck come and pass right by us. The shadow goes right over us. It never affects us a bit. But those of us that know Christ as our Savior, that's the way we are. We never die. We have eternal life with Christ. And how great it is to know that He loves us and He cares for us and He'll take care of us for all through eternity. And like we said, Ralph was Ralph was real adamant about, about the word. It's the complete and errant and infallible word of God. There can't be anything more powerful than that. And that's what that's the reason that every time that I preach, I want to make sure that I preach the word. That's where the power is. It's not in the charisma of a preacher. It has to be the word. Because I heard some fellow put it out in my younger times and I thought, well, he must be much of a preacher. But when I looked at the effects of what he did, it was a good preacher. He was preaching the word. That's what we want to do. Every one of us can do it, whether we whether we get the chance to get the pulpit or not. We still can do it through our life. A witness. You say, well, I don't know how to witness. But if Christ has spoken peace in your heart, you can tell anybody. I was lost. I accepted Christ as my Savior and my life has been changed. Like I can tell you, when our dad was probably as effective evangelist as I ever listened to, I don't feel like I could hold the mic and begin to preach by it. But when I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and I knew that I was lost, I was just a boy laying on the bed on, on, down in the uh, bedroom was in the lower part of the house. I remember lying awake sometime and couldn't sleep. And I think, you know, if I don't wake up at one, I'm going to be in hell for eternity. And once I accepted Christ as my Savior, I had never felt that again. Sometimes I don't speak too good. But for me, worrying about eternity, the Holy Spirit put something in me that gave me the peace that passes understanding. And I want you to know now that any of us can get this, those of us that know Christ never get tired of hearing what I'm going to tell you now. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It says we all have sinned, every one of us. I know these, these pastors that are up here, they're really good boys. I love them, but they've sinned. We all have sinned. All we are are sinners saved by the grace of Christ. But it says the gift of God is eternal life. But the wages of sin is death. That means that what you're doing is working. You're going to get paid. You'll get paid, and there won't be any way of getting out of it unless you know Christ for your Savior. But he said, but the gift of God, that's something you give to. You didn't earn it, but it's just because Christ loved you. And so the penalty of sin is being apart from God for all eternity without any hope. You know, everything that we see here is just temporary. We think, well, it'll be over before long. We think, well, this will, and, and everything we know is. But 
that that heart for God for eternity is something that I wouldn't wish on the worst enemy or the worst person to ever live. But the truth of the matter is, is that Christ died for him just the same way that he died for us. And that should be our every moment of our life of concentrating on making sure that we point others to him so that they can have what we have. I know this is great for us see all of our relatives. Uh, you know, my grandchildren couldn't, couldn't be here, but to see all of this, I know that that's, that's the mark of success. It's not a great big bank account. Success is what we have put up for the Lord. And to lead our children to Christ and our grandchildren to Christ, that's what, that's what really matters. But we, this is what God's provision for us. This from Romans also, for so well put. For God demonstrated that his love toward us, that though we were still sinners, he died for us. And through the wages of sin's death, Christ died in people's stead. And he died for us to pay for our dead sin. And here's the way that we can make things right with God. This is what it says, what, what the Bible says, that if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Christ was born of a virgin and died and was raised again then, then you'll be saved but the Bible says you can't see that I've heard people say well you know I believe and I've got faith but the Bible says even the devils believe they know all about it they believe probably more than you do but this is where this is what it takes or if thou wilt if thou wilt, uh, or if thou wilt confess with thy mouth, that by thy mouth confession is made unto salvation, and you believe unto righteousness, but salvation comes through that confession. And let the world know. It doesn't have to be a loud speech. Just the fact that you would come up and when the invitation is given to church, that you're standing up and say, I want you to come to Christ. That confession without that lost for eternity. And so I know that that's what Ralph believes. And I know that I, and I think the instructions are already had for my funeral. I know this but this is a story that's told many times. But I want to say it at my funeral too. I tell people how to get saved. Now this is going to be a little difficult for me to talk to you. I want to know. Uh, come up with my brother here and, and to preach at his funeral. It's not half as hard as it was when I came as a preacher funeral for a man that never came to church, never did anything for anybody else. It is obvious that he had no hope for eternity. It's not half that hard. But how do you get that? How do you get saved? That's what I say it doesn't make a man saved or lost. But here's what I do. I tell them the same story that I've told you here. That those people that are saved never get tired of hearing it. I never get tired of hearing it. I'm salvation. The ones that are saved never get tired of it. And the ones that aren't saved need to know. Need to know the plan and what God's plan is that we might have in life eternal. And have that peace that passes understanding. I guess that's the greatest thing that I feel is knowing that I have peace with the Lord. That's what I witnessed to a Jewish girl one time who was on the way to a on the way to Israel, I, 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 I got to witness to her and tell her everything I told you right here. And I told her, and I said, there's nothing better than being in complete peace with God. And if you never do, you never call another breath, that you just go to be with him for eternity. And she wrote a blog about it. And uh, she asked me to be all right. And she wrote about her conversation she did. And then she said about how nice it was to talk to somebody that talked about me is described in all she says and he doesn't need anything else and that's my heart today I don't need anything else my future secure with Christ and I know that I'm in the queue well this comes for everybody that's why I don't stand on the side because I know that the judgment is not there for me because I have Christ as my redeemer thank the Lord for the privilege of being his child Thank him for speaking, speaking to our grandmother and 
grandfather that turned us from a life of cooking and put together. That's what passes down one generation to the next. That they taught us what we know today about the Word of God. May the Lord bless you. Love every one of you kids. You all know, I hope you all know Ben. I'm sure you do. Excited to see your successes. And the Lord bless you. Very, very heavy. But as I was thinking about this and what to say today, I was thinking uh, of the last words that I heard from Ralph and Carolyn about two weeks ago when they were on their way to Roanoke and they called us up on the phone and was talking to us. And, uh, and the last word that Ralph said was, uh, Pastor Owens, you and Janice said, anytime you're in Beckley, you know you have a place to stay. They always had that warm, open heart and, and caring for, for others. And uh, so that was so encouraging. Also, uh, of course, at our church, a small church that I pastored there, it was Calvary Heights Community Church at that time, which is Fellowship Bible now. But, you know, we worked together. We had a small church, but there, there is blessings in small churches. I agree, big churches are good too. But uh, you get to know people, you get to hang together, and work together, and pray together, and 
sing together and all those good things where you really get to know people. And uh, as, as I got to know Ralph, of course, being an electrical engineer, uh, he knew electricity. So one time I was having trouble with my uh, dishwasher. It was an electrical problem. So, uh, so I asked Ralph if he'd come down and look at it and see if there's any hope for it. And so he came down and came in the house there. And Janice, we greeted him and we talked a little bit. And uh, Janice said to him, Ralph, he said, uh, I told Roy, just get over it and get another dishwasher. So she's blowing off my hopes of trying to get that thing fixed. And I always like to try to get as much mileage out of anything as I can. So Ralph goes in and, and he gets down on the floor there and I pull the bottom off of it before he can get to the motor and check the electric and all that on it. And so he was laying there on the floor and he looked up at me and he said, Roy, get over. <laughs> so that was the final word that, uh, that uh, took care of that dishwasher and I got another dishwasher. <laughs> so, uh, also, I wanted to say, too, that Ralph was a pretty conservative guy, too, just like I was, you know. We wanted to be wise with the things that the Lord gave us and, and take care of them and whatever. But, uh, but Ralph, he was especially conservative when it comes to heat. But you can talk to his daughters and find out about that. Because they said in the wintertime, when it would be cold as cold could be, they would get up out of bed they would breathe and they could see their breath there from, from the cold air that, uh, that they was in. But Ralph's word was, you know, a, a cold room is more healthy. <laughs> so he had, a, he had a word for it too there. So. <laughs> but anyway, I think we always got a laugh out of that as well. And then I'll make it uh, as brief as I can, but uh, I'd like to talk to you about a retreat that we had one time as a church boat where we went out we spent the night out at, uh, in, in Daniel's area on a flu year at a place called Churchland. We rented the facilities from Crane Orchard Baptist Church. And uh, so so we uh, was there where we had dorms. We had the dorms for the men and the dorms for the, for the women. And so there was some of the college students that went out with us and uh, enjoyed the time. We had to play games and and eighth grade, and, uh, and I think that was a time that Jim Saunders was their speaker at that retreat. And so Jim reminded us, though, that as Christians, the retreat was a bad thing. He said, Christians don't have any armor from the back, so we don't retreat. We need to rename it advance, because we got armor from the front, and we're to go forward for the Lord. So he challenged us in, in light of that, that thought. But it came time to go to bed that night, so the women went to their quarters, and the men went to their quarters. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the college student, the men went with us, and uh, so we slept that night. I slept good, and I think everybody else did too. And uh, so the next morning, Janice got up, and for whatever reason, went out to the band, church band that we had, and looked, and there was, uh, uh, Pink Davis, who's a missionary to New Zealand, and uh, Pink, Ron Gant, Ron uh, Garman. Garman? Yeah. So they were in the band. And Jared said to them, fellas, why in the world would you come and get in a band with them short seats? They had one, one long seat along the back. I don't know which one slept right there. But they said, Mrs. Owens, you've never been in a room with Ralph Reinhardt, John Cam, Joe West, and Pastor Owens. And hear what we heard. I guess we were scoring so loud that they thought it was better to suffer out in the van than it was to sleep in the bed there, or try to sleep in the bed there in the room. So, so we've always had a, a good laugh about that. And then also, I was going to say, uh, uh, Jerry Scarborough, he, he's very observant. He, he, he uh, was a new Christian, and he, he observed and watched people. 
And Ralph and Carolyn, they would sit on the front rows of the church. When Carol was playing the piano, she was on one side, or playing the organ, she was sitting on the other side. And so, of course, Ralph would be right there on the side of her, and she'd get up playing and come back and sit down. And so, Jerry observed Ralph. He was all the time had his arm around her, and he was practically like that. And I think Jerry thought that he was uh, hurting Carolyn. So he said, uh, Carolyn, and he said, Ralph, he said, uh, he said, what are you all time hitting on Carol? Ralph uh, smiled and said, you know, he said, that's a lot of taps. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know, Ralph, he, he, he does that over and over again, folks. He truly, truly loved his wife. As I was thinking and summing it up, the Reinhardt were such fun loving people. And when you hear news like that of the accident with the lawnmower, and your mind wandered around what, what could have happened, and then finally word came that he was uh, uh, down on the trail, uh, mowing the grass on the trail. And so my thought was, you know, if there's one word that I would think of in light of, of Ralph, and that was the fact that he was thinking of others. And he was preparing that trail, I think, for family and for friends or anyone that would want to go on a nature hike down, down that trail. And so there he was giving himself, as he does in so many ways. And today is a testimony of what a changed life because of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ has seen. And the blessing and the heritage that we see have seen in the grandchildren and the remains up here on the stage today and what's come out of their loins and the honor and blessing of the Lord and the heritage that they have to continue on faithfully for the Lord Jesus. And what a challenge has been to my heart today and I trust to yours as well that we want to keep on keeping on for the Lord because to end well means to have that wonderful expression, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's what I believe every Christian should be looking forward and wanting in their lives is to hear that from the, from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's bow together in a word of prayer as we conclude. Our Father, we thank you so much again today for what we've been able to hear and the testimonies of uh, changed lives and, and the testimony of this one, your child, when we've taken to glory to be with you. And Lord, we thank you for those who are left behind, but we know that in the midst of this, there's bitter sweet experience. It's bitter because we will not be able to hear that voice and see that smile and have that uh, experience with, that, with him now. But Lord, we thank you for the hope because of his faith in Christ of where he's at. And we know that as the scripture says, I have not seen, neither ear, neither ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them to love him. And so we take confidence in, in, in that today. And we pray especially as we think of our dear sister Carolyn and her family and friends and all, and that you'll comfort and encourage them and uh, give them the, the strength to continue on faithfully lifting up and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And we again thank you for the testimony of our good brother who's in your presence now. We love you and praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming and supporting our family. Such an encouragement. Such an encouragement. Thank you. At this time, we're just going to turn it over to uh, the funeral director and then we'll be dismissed.